a lot of interesting issues that are occurring. Uh, we have plenty of food, so feel free to gorge yourselves. Um, you're encouraged to. Uh, this is uh, Professor Josh Blackman, a uh, law professor at uh, Southern Texas University. He is uh, uh, very prolific. Uh, uh, so he has 22 law review articles. And he's, uh, he's on the Times Top 30 under 30. So he's, uh, 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 he's written a book on Obamacare. Um, uh, his guest blog at Bob's University. Um, and uh, we'll have a question and answer session right after uh, the event. Uh, so uh, without further ado, Okay, well, thank you for the few who uh, braved the, uh, I guess, the wind to attend. So I'm very grateful for you, uh, for you to be here. My discussion today focuses on data and the First Amendment. <clears throat> and specifically, what happens when the government tries to regulate data? And what are the First Amendment implications of this? Now, I discuss this in a few different contexts. Search engines, the right to be forgotten, and a fairly cool angle, 3D printed guns. In each case, data is being used to convey certain types of ideas. And in each case, the government has seen fit to perhaps regulate these ideas outside the context of normal first amendment contours. So the question I want to pose to you is, are these elements of communication subject to the first amendment? And if so, would these types of regulations withstand constitutional scrutiny? So let's just start off by discussing what is data, okay? Now, I am not discussing code, right? The actual zeros and ones of machine language. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm actually discussing is actually information created by computers. So the easiest example for you to think of is Google. When you go to google.com and you type in a search, it spits out a lot of information the same way a librarian would give you answers to a question you asked. But there's no human being underneath the hood. Google has very sophisticated algorithms that look at what you're searching for, scour the internet, and plugs in the exact answer to your question. Or for example, Siri on your iPhone. Rather than doing a search, you ask it a question. Siri, you know, what's the closest Italian restaurant? It goes, BB, here's your answer, right? Again, there was no human being actually engaged in the task of finding the closest Italian restaurant, but the information it gave you is perfectly analogous to what a, of what a concierge, if you will, would give you. Or, or let's give you another example. You've all used ESPN.com, I'm sure. This may surprise you, but a, a number of articles written on ESPN.com about sports events were not created by human beings. You can actually have a program that looks at a box score of a game sees what points were scored, who scored these points, when there were rebounds, when there were steals, what the flow of the scoring was, and can actually generate a story that is indistinguishable for you. It's actually a very good Turing test. I can give you these stories, right? You would never know that they were created by a computer, right? So the question becomes, is this speech, is this the sort of speech that the First Amendment would protect? And if the answer is yes, then what power does government have to regulate it? So let's focus first on search engines, because this is probably the most uh, uh, relatable example we have. The government is not too happy with Google for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons that they're not too happy with Google is because their search results are, shall we say, biased. Okay? Google never pretends that their search results are the correct answer. They're actually very open to the fact that if you're someone who gives Google money and pays for sponsorships, your uh, results will appear very, very much at the top. Right? This is Google's business model. They pay. But it's not just the sponsored results also. Various companies that do business with Google are probably more likely to be favored higher up. If you play business with Google, you follow their algorithms, et cetera, you're very high up. What happens if you don't play ball with Google, right? So has anyone ever heard of Rap Genius? Anyone know about this? Rap Genius is a website that posts, you know, rap lyrics and analysis of the rap lyrics, whatever, right? They were trying to be smart. They spammed Google's search engine, trying to get their rankings to the very top page. You know what Google did? They retaliated against them. They buried them on page five of the Google search results. When was the last time anyone ever, anyone ever clicked on page five? Never, right? By doing that, Google basically disappeared them, right? It's talking about a right to be forgotten. They were gone. Even if you Googled rapgenius.com, they'd be on page five of the search results. In other contexts of the law, someone say that's unfair competition. 
That's tortious interference, right? That's various aspects competing that's unlawful business transactions. <laughs> okay. What happens if, you know, Rap Genius brought a challenge under state a uh, state uh, competition law or antitrust law, whatever it happens to be? Would that challenge succeed? Now, this case was not brought, but invariably, what would Google argue? First Amendment. Our search results are speech. And you can't punish me for speaking about Rap Genius, right? The mere fact that I listed them in this order is based on my understanding of what relevance is, what my rank is, right? There is not a First Amendment right to rank your site based on where it should actually appear. Yep. I'm going to put aside the antitrust concerns because those are legitimate, right? There are legit antitrust concerns here. Let's just focus on the First Amendment. Now, would Google win that suit? Well, that suit with Rap Genius was never brought, but there have been other cases where basically companies have sued Google for burying them on page 15. And the courts have held, listen, this is speech. This is no different. If in the olden days you had a, you know, a travel guide, right, that listed the best restaurants in the city, and that travel guide decided to list these five restaurants excluded others, okay, that was an editorial decision. But then Rap Genius would reply, wait a minute, what editorial decision? There's code, right? This is just simply code. This is not some sort of human judgment. So you're starting to see how this problem develops. So the way I like to think about it, and again, this is my own theory. This is not necessarily uh, uh, correct, but the way I think about it is, you know, what's the interaction between a human and a machine, right? How close is the nexus, if you will, between a human being and the uh, 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 output? So let me use an example involving art, which is an easy to use example. Say you have, you know, a canvas or a piece of paper, and, uh, you know, I start splashing paint on the canvas, right? I have no artistic skill, but I'm splashing paint on the canvas. I think everyone would concede that that was protected expression, right? Even if I, like, you know, drew up, you know, some sort of pornography or whatever it is, right? I am engaging in artistic expression. Second example, what happens instead of using a piece of canvas and paint, I use Adobe Photoshop or use my iPad, and I just, you know, swing my mouse or my tablet, whatever, across, and I draw some random image. I think, again, everyone would concede that this is protected speech, right? It's still me using some form of electronic medium to get to an expression, all right? Let me give you a third example, right? Let's say Adobe Photoshop, it's an app, has a random feature. I press one button, and it generates a randomly drawn picture. Random. I, didn't, I just click generate. What if that picture was obscene, right? Maybe borderline obscenity. Would I have, or what if it creates, say, child pornography, right? I don't know. Reno v. ACLU. Would I have a First Amendment right by just clicking random? Okay. So you see, as you move away from human involvement, your intuitive sense is this is less similar to what speech, you know, what the courts protect in the past. <laughs> Let me give you a, a fourth example, right? Let's say, you know, I'm an engineer and I build a robot, right? And I put this robot in this arm, a paintbrush, and in the other hand, a can of paint, and I say, go. And it just goes through random algorithms and splashes its arm on the board, right? And say it paints something that's obscene or, you know, unprotected activity, child pornography, whatever, right? Would this be protected? This is a harder question, because it's a, really a robot who doesn't know what the heck it's doing. It's just flailing its arms with a paintbrush in its hand, creating something, OK? Now, let me modify that with a fifth example, if I may. Everyone knows what Pandora is, Spotify, right? These are programs that learn your tastes. They learn what kind of music you like, and they actually make a playlist for you based on your preferences. Let's say I built Pandora for art. I go you know, down the street to the Chicago Art Institute. I have my app and say, I like this painting. I like this painting. I don't like this painting. I like this painting. If you do that enough, the computer will build a profile for you. It will actually learn, you know, what kind of art you like, what kind of art you don't like. And the same way in the old days, you would actually commission an artist to make something based on your taste. That's how, that's how art used to work. You would hire an artist saying, listen, I want something like this, but a little different. Fine. Let's say the robot now learns what kind of art you want. And of course, I don't have the dexterity to paint. I'm very competent, right? But let's say, you know, I had a vision in my mind of what my art was. The robot actually then knows what I want. It basically paints the picture that I have in my head. Would that be something that we want to protect the speech? It's effectively a manifestation of what I have in my head, 
But the simple fact is I didn't do anything. I simply like, you know, downloaded an app, right? Is that protected speech? And I think that is perhaps the, uh, the crux of this issue, right? Are we willing to give protection of the First Amendment to something that was done almost entirely without human interaction, maybe marginally at the outset, okay? So this question, though, is difficult because of what happens if the question the answer is yes, right? That's the theme of my talk. What happens if data is speech? If the answer is yes, it's speech, there's a lot of stuff that gains first amendment protections that we may not want to have that value. So let's start off with data, uh, data privacy regulations, right? Um, Eugene Volokh at UCLA made this point uh, many years ago where he said, you know, data privacy laws are great. But if you think about it, every single data privacy law at its heart is telling someone not to speak, right? If you say you are broadcasting private information, stop. You are stopping someone from speaking. So every single data privacy law runs into the First Amendment. And we have certain very narrow exceptions to this. And you can see the privacy torts in the restatement, you know, public disclosure, private fact, and the like. But invariably, you'll have a judge telling a person, stop speaking. And that's something which generally our First Amendment does not countenance, right? Our First Amendment does not allow judges to engage in a prior restraint and tell someone to stop speaking, okay? What happens if we have a data privacy regulation? Let's discuss in the European context something called the right to be forgotten, right? This right to be forgotten more or less says that you have the power to tell a search engine like Google to remove links off the internet. Mind you, you're not actually deleting the content, which is a common misconception, right? You're not actually removing the content from the internet because, frankly, you can't remove from the internet. It's, it's in the internet. It's in the cloud. It's gone. But what you're actually doing is telling a search engine like Google or Yahoo, you cannot index that page, right? You need to take that page out of your search results. And if you don't take those results out, uh, you're in a lot of trouble. You can get fined by the European Commission on whatever and the high priestess in Geneva and, you know, the hell, hell will rain down on you, right? Right? Whatever, whatever's going on in Europe. But the point stands that this is a very popular proposal, okay? Could this type of law exist in the United States, and I'll get to net neutrality in a minute, but this is actually a possibility, right? Could the United States require this? In order to get there, the government would have to tell Google, which claims it's an information provider, no, you cannot display that link. Google will reply, wait a minute, you know, we may decide that a person has a valid claim, we may, you know, accept a request to take stuff out. But if all these people start saying, oh, take this out, take this out, take this out, it screws up our search results, right? We are a business whose entire uh, uh, livelihood is premised on giving the best possible search results. Once you let people start fussing with that and messing stuff up, we don't have that accuracy. We can no longer be the concierge or the curator of the internet because we can't even promise our results were definitive. So what happens? Google raises the First Amendment. Will they win? Um, I tend to think the answer under current case is yes, they would win for the simple fact that what they're doing is they're expressing information. And the Supreme Court has made clear in a number of contexts the mere fact that the expression is being done electronically does not deprive it of First Amendment protection. So we have a case a couple years ago called Sorel v. IMS Health. In that case, the court basically held data is speech, right? Data is protected. We have a case a couple years earlier, Brown versus EMA. This was a violent video games case. Supreme Court said again, the mere fact that you are making a violent video game rather than writing a grim fairy tale, you still get protection. So I think in many respects, the type of business that Google's engaged in would be protected. Right? So I think the search engines are probably uh, an easier case where they win. But one thing to keep in mind going forward, right, is what happens when our communications become more closely intertwined with our devices. Okay? It's very easy to say, oh, yeah, Google's spitting out search results. But what happens if, you know, I use my robot app, and I use my robot app to create art, or I use my robot app to create music, or various things which are in sense mine, okay? This is why I encourage you, don't jump up and say, what about commercial speech? I'm sure some of you are thinking of this, right? Isn't this just commercial speech? The, the problem with commercial speech is 
it basically vitiates any individual expression. Here, so much of what's going on is actually individualistic. If I'm using a program to generate music or art or writing with my own thoughts, I have a very close nexus to that. And the mere fact that the commercial app from Apple or Google should not deprive it of any first amendment value. Okay? So in terms of you know, uh, uh, the right to be forgotten, I think that's in very dangerous territory. Um, another topic which is fairly novel is net neutrality. This is this big proposal. It's a 400-page plan, which I haven't read yet. I, I skimmed parts of it, where basically the United States government wants to treat Verizon and Comcast and other providers as uh, common carriers, the same way you would treat a utility for electricity or utility for telecommunications, um, and that they can't charge more. So the only aspect of this I want to discuss, because I don't really know much about communications law, is the First Amendment. The government's taking the position that the ISPs, like Verizon or Comcast, they're just dumb pipes. They're just spitting information through tubes, and they're in no way modifying. And they actually said Comcast and Verizon are not speakers. If you actually read the, uh, the FCC report, it says they're not speakers. Okay? Why does it say that? Because once you treat someone as a speaker, you give them constitutional scrutiny, and then you lose. So they were very careful to say that Verizon is not a speaker. They're merely, I send an email, and it goes through Verizon's network. Verizon does nothing to change the message. Okay, that's important, because in contrast, Google says, we are speakers. We're creating content, our maps, our graphics, et cetera, right? We're actually uh, uh, prioritizing and ranking things. That involves our editorial judgment. So Google says we are a speaker. I think that's probably the right answer. But one thing to think about, and this, this is more of, a, of an antitrust argument than one of a, a, a constitutional law, but there's a serious potential for market failure here. And let me, let me describe this, right? Sure, you can say if Google spits out bad search results, they'll lose market share and people go to Yahoo or whatever. But at this point, Google has such a homogeny in search results. They have, I think, almost 80% of, of, of traffic. They can, they can begin to stack search results, and we would never even know it. In other words, if they were so inclined, they could actually engage in business that can punish their competition. They could just downplay anyone who's not within their graces, and we would never even know it. And it would have to be a lot. It could be subtle. Bumping down a couple places is enough to put someone out of business. So to the extent antitrust law prevent that kind of uh, uh, activity, especially someone with a near monopoly power, you may want, you may want it, that the government can maybe step in. I'm not saying this is correct, but it's a possibility. So the question is, what scares you more? And this is where it comes down to for me. What scares you more? That the government can control search results, or the government can't control search results, right? Does it scare you more that the government can actually go in there and tell Google what to do, or does it scare you that Google cannot be told what to do? And I don't know the answer to that one. I, I go back and forth. But depending on how you come down to that one, you can really see uh, a, 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 different, a different perspective, OK? So I'd like next to turn. I'll take lots of questions and answers later. Uh, I'd like next to turn to the question of one very uh, a, a common and popular uh, aspect of this, which is 3D printed guns, OK? And you're saying, Josh, I thought we were talking about the First Amendment here. Why, why are you talking about guns, right? This is not a Second Amendment discussion. Well, the answer is actually yes. There's a very strong overlap between the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, and 3D printed guns. Okay, why? Because data is speech. Data is expression. The way 3D printing works, and some of you may know this, but some of you may not, is it actually converts Three-dimensional objects, like I'm holding this bottle in my hand, right? You can actually describe this bottle. Let's pretend it's a cylinder, right? With a radius of X and a height of Y and a color of Z, right? You can actually define what things look like. And the same way I'm describing this object, I'm talking about it to you. I'm speaking. In much the same way, when you design architectural blueprints or designs or pictures, right? You're actually engaging in speech. If I want to describe the cylinder, right, it says height 20, radius 5. You can actually use words and expressions to dictate what things look like. Is this speech, is this something that can be protected under the First Amendment of the Constitution? Okay? And you can make all sorts of cool gadgets with 3D printing, very sophisticated designs. You use things called 3D printers. 
And the way these work is they lay down very thin layers of plastic in order to generate objects. And here's how one of these things look like. Uh, and here, here's your nice schematic. So basically what happens is you have this hose, and it spritzes a little layer of plastic. The way I like to think about this is like a candle. Everyone knows how to make a candle? You take a wick, a piece of string, you dip it in the wax. You lift it up, you dip in the wax again. You do this over and over again. And each time you dip the candle, it gets a little bit thicker because more wax uh, uh, coalesces around the, around the uh, wick. Exactly the same way. Each time it spritzes a little bit more of this plastic uh, 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 liquid, it makes the object a little bit taller. So I'll show you an example. So this is going to be 3D printing an object, which I'm sure all of you know about. And I want you to stop me when you figure out what the object is, right? Okay? So just stop when you see it. So it starts off by printing this honeycomb fill, right? So it puts this entire lattice to a very thin layer. And it gets taller and taller and taller. If you notice, stop me. You'll see it in about two seconds. Taller, 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 close. Yoda. <laughs> I always get it. Usually, once someone got on this one, yeah, it's, it's, it's Yoda from Star Wars, right? So if you see, you can actually make fully three-dimensional objects. You see that? Layering one on top of the other with very detailed schematics. And almost there. Now you see it, right? So basically, by merely layering one thin layer, we're talking you know, micrometers of plastic, one on top of the other, in a very sophisticated object, okay? And even things that are 3D and kind of crazy. So, you know, we're, we're Americans, right? What do you think happens if someone wants to create something with 3D printing? What are they gonna build? Come on. Of course a gun, right? This is America, what else are we going to build with 3D printers? Yoda's fun, we can't shoot him with that, right? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> This is America. We have a God-given right to guns or something like that, and that's what we're going to build. So 3D guns present a somewhat of a different problem, okay? Because now there's an additional layer of things for the government to worry about. It's not just someone using the gun to shoot someone or selling the gun or even manufacturing the gun. Now there's an additional step in the process, transferring information about the gun. So let's talk about the Liberator. Okay, and I need to actually, for some disclosure, I'm actually consulting with Cody Wilson, who you'll see here. I'm actually consulting for him, so I'm doing work for him, so I, I need to disclose that. But Cody Wilson is a, was a law student at UT Austin in Texas, and he decided that he wanted to build a 3D printed gun. And he, uh, he is very much influenced by Bastiat, among others, uh, uh, and he's a, he's a very big sectament enthusiast, to put, to put it mildly. So he developed this. This is what's called an AR-15 lower. I realize Rahm Emanuel might arrest me if I talk about this, but this is effectively a part of a gun that allows it to shoot. Okay? These are not regulated, to make it simple. If you put this AR-15 lower into a gun, you can use it. Okay? He was able to do this. He was also able to make a magazine. This is the thing that holds the bullet. He called it the Cuomo, after the governor of New York. And this was able to handle hundreds of rounds of ammunition in an AR-15 uh, semi-automatic rifle. Okay? But this was only the start. He had built the receiver, which is part of a gun. He had built this uh, uh, magazine, which was part of the gun. But then he built the Liberator. This was a 3D printed gun made entirely out of parts that can be printed from a 3D printer, right? Every part of this gun is plastic, except for this. That's a nail, okay? Why does a gun need a nail? If I was in Alabama, I wouldn't say this, but in Chicago, I will. The way a gun works, okay, is you have a bullet with a charge on it. You take a firing pin or something sharp to pierce the back of the bullet. When you pierce the back of the bullet, it goes kaboom and sends a projectile forward. So basically, any gun needs some sort of metal firing pin to go kaboom, right? That's what you need. So the Liberator was basically an entirely self-contained gun that works autonomously using totally printed parts on a 3D printer. And this is what looks like completed. Um, it's not a very effective gun, nor is it very efficient. But it was designed as a proof of concept that using only 3D printers, you can make an entire gun. Here's another shot of it. Okay. 
And here's a picture of him shooting it, which, by the way, was actually very risky. Initially, he had a rig where he had a piece of string attached to the trigger, and he was, like, saying five feet away and was, like, pulling it, lest it explode in his hand. So um, not, not a joke. Uh, testing a gun is a very dangerous deal. So Cody built this gun, right? So what's the problem? Can the government ban this activity? Can the government get rid of 3D printed guns? So I want to correct an image that some of you may have in your mind, that like you have an inkjet printer and you press print and like a gun pops out, okay? This is simply not the case. This is not how it works. I also want to correct one image in your mind that before this, people never made guns by themselves. This is simply false. So everyone here a zip gun, perhaps you're not from Chicago, okay? It's very easy to make a gun if you know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, it's pretty easy, okay? This is a soldering iron attached to a garden hose, okay? It's a gun. This is one of those little keychain flashlights. Everyone know what these are? Like the little keychain flashlights? It's a gun. You put a little bullet there, and what you do is you jangle, boom, and it goes kapow. I want to show you, there's a video on YouTube. Some idiots in a garage <laughs> built a gun out of a piece of rubber tubing, a metal pipe, and a shotgun shell. You can go to Home Depot and buy these parts for like $5, okay? You too can make a gun that will evade metal detectors for $5. I think it will get arrested by Rahm Emanuel in about 30 seconds, but it's true you can. So let me show you the video. You have the, the rubber tubing. You have this metal cylinder with this little dimple on the end, right? This is effectively the firing pin. When this little dimple hits the shotgun cartridge, it goes kaboom and sends the projectile forward. So what do you do? Okay, first of all, don't do this inside. Okay, these guys are idiots, but it can be done. So you load the shotgun shell in, okay? By the way, this is their target practice. You can see all these holes on the cardboard box and where they're about to shoot. Again, do not shoot inside. This is very dumb. This is very dumb. So they load the shotgun shell, this little gold thing you can see inside the tube, okay? They line up the metal pipe next to the shotgun shell. What do you think happens next? Boom. They jam. Everyone's shaking their head. Yes, you're right. They jam the shotgun shell into the tube and explodes. Okay? And there's actually another hole that pops up that you'll see in a second. Okay. Again, electricity. Not a good idea. <laughs> this is really dumb. If you Google this on YouTube, they're actually saying some really dumb stuff too. That gets expelled from Oklahoma University, right? Do not do not do this. These guys are morons. But my point is, with $5 of parts from Home Depot and no skill, they just made a gun that can, that can evade uh, metal detectors, right? It's rubber tubing. The pipe, you, you don't even think what that is, right? So, smoke coming out of it. Yes, yes, genius. And you actually see the shotgun shell has been expended. Okay? So, granted, these guys are morons. I think, I think we all agree with that here. Right? These guys are idiots. But is what they did illegal? No. So this may surprise you, but our favorite convenience store, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, right? They have effectively taken the position that manufacturing guns by yourself, not for sale, but by making a gun for yourself is perfectly lawful. If you sell it, it's a different story. But you can manufacture a gun yourself. And there are people who are a lot smarter than these idiots, right? If you have a machine shop and you have an idea how to use a lathe and different machines, you can make a gun very easily. It's not that difficult, right? I am, I am totally incompetent on these things, but I've seen people make them. It's not hard, okay? So what happens to Cody, right? If it's perfectly legal to make your own guns, why is there anything wrong with Cody Wilson distributing these 3D printed guns? Well. I've, as I've already discussed, there's some First Amendment issues here. Generally speaking, the government cannot restrict you from speaking, right? They cannot limit your expression based on the content of their speech. What happens if they say, you can't publish information about something because it's dangerous, right? If you put this information at the 3D guns online, you know, someone can get hurt. 
is this a valid constitutional argument? No. So has everyone heard of the Anarchist Cookbook, right? This is a book that was popular during the 60s and 70s. Bill Ayers, I'm sure somewhere in the neighborhood, right? Where basically, come on, I'm in Chicago. So I got, I got to make it contemporary. Basically, this is a book that told you to blow stuff up, right? This book gave instructions how to make pipe bombs. You know, this is on the Weather Underground, like top reading list, right? This is what they read. You know, it's a dangerous book. And governments tried to ban the sale of this book. Imagine that, a government saying, you cannot put the book on your shelves. You know, there was no Amazon. If you don't have a book on the shelves, you know, where are you going to get it? Courts held consistently that the government cannot restrict the sale of this book. The mere fact that the book itself is dangerous does not allow you to ban it. And I'll, I'll make this point even more emphatically, right? We have a case in our First Amendment case called Brandenburg, the Ohio. This was a case where you had a member of the Ku Klux Klan was at a rally. And he was right, you know, inciting people saying, we need to go to Washington and we need to do this and that and clan stuff, right, whatever. And he was basically arrested under Ohio law. And what did the Supreme Court say? He could not be arrested for speaking unless there was an imminent, imminent unlawful incitement to violence. He's saying, let's go march in Washington next week. That was not good enough. So basically under our court's precedent, unless you're actually inciting people to violence right away, your speech cannot be stifled. So the mere fact that you're selling a book with instructions how to make a bomb, that doesn't fly. You can't ban that. I'll take it even one step further. If you're describing how to build a gun, which maybe someone could use to harm someone, it's a very attenuated connection, right, by, by under our first amendment standards. Because after all, information is speech. And as we discussed, the mere fact that you use zeros and ones to exchange information does not deprive you of your value. In this case, Sorel v. IMS Health, Justice Kennedy for the court said very clearly, creation and dissemination of information or speech. It's not just creating the painting or creating the 3D blueprint of the gun. The quintessential aspect of communication is dissemination, sharing it, sending it. It's not enough to make a blueprint for a gun by yourself. What essence of speech is, is sharing it and sending it abroad. And this is a very important framework as we start thinking about 3D printed guns. Because virtually everything we do, like Neo and the Matrix, is data. So much of what we do is data. And if we take the position that suddenly just because you use a computer rather than a piece of paper, that your speech is no longer protected, we're in trouble. Right? We are in trouble. So let's change gears a bit and talk about my other favorite amendment, which is the Second Amendment. Right, which is until recently didn't exist in this city, but thanks to McDonald v. Chicago, we now have a Second Amendment. By the way, everyone know Otis McDonald passed away in the past year. He was the lead plaintiff in McDonald v. Chicago. He died like six months ago. So rest in peace, Otis. The Second Amendment, we all know, based on a case called District of Columbia versus Heller, this is Dick Heller, says, you have an individual right to keep and bear arms. Okay? What kind of gun? The court didn't exactly say, but we know that a handgun, which is a quintessential health self-defense weapon, is protected, right? We also know that the government has various restrictions on it. They say you can't bring guns to sensitive places, people who are dangerous can't have guns, etc., etc. But we all know the basic aspect of Heller is you have an individual right to bear arms. And by the way, this is, this is Oda McDon Otis McDonald. He died in the last year or so. And this is Dick Heller and Otis McDonald, uh, uh, Supreme Court plaintiffs, uh, uh, chumming it up. Okay? So let's think about the Second Amendment here, right? Okay, great. So you have, you have the right to keep their arms, right? Fine. The government passes a law banning the sale of all guns. You cannot buy a gun anywhere. Does the Second Amendment mean much to you? Well, maybe if you had a gun before this law came to effect, you could keep your gun. The, the government's not saying, you know, if you like your health insurance, you can keep your health insurance, right? If you like your gun, you can keep your guns. They're saying, fine, whatever guns you have, keep, but you can't buy or acquire any new guns. I think everyone in this room would agree that that's problematic. In order to actually bear arms, you need to get it from somewhere. And virtually everyone buys guns. What happened to Dick Heller back in the day? The District of Columbia said, okay, Dick, you had this gun from the 70s. You can keep it, okay? But you have to keep under lock and key. If you take the lock off, the District of Columbia said, you're breaking the law. So he actually had this gun locked up for almost 30 years, okay? 
after the case, he went and he got his permit. And now he's able to acquire a new gun. So what's the significance of that? I think the Second Amendment protects, at the minimum, some basic right to actually acquire a gun. Why is this right there? Because if you can't acquire a gun, what are you going to keep and bear? Okay. Another aspect of the Second Amendment that I like to discuss is the right to make arms. Okay. What does this mean, the right to make arms? Well, an alternative to buying a gun is actually making one yourself. And as I've discussed from our favorite convenience store, Apple Tobacco and Firearms, you have this long-standing uh, ability to create your own guns. Going back to the colonial era, right? People made their own muskets. The Tea Party, they mustered the militia, and they had their own guns. If you ever watch the John Adams miniseries, which I'd recommend, there's this great scene where Abigail Adams is pouring lead and making musket balls, right? This is a core aspect of American history. So I think even stronger than the right to acquire arms is the right to make arms. Okay? Why is this important? Because of 3D guns. 3D printed guns in a, in a bizarre way brings together the First Amendment and the Second Amendment in a very unique and hybrid fashion. How is this? The government is stopping you from speaking about a constitutional right. Let me say that again. By banning the blueprints of 3D guns, the government is stopping you from speaking about a constitutional right. You have the right to bear arms. You certainly have the right to talk about that right to bear arms, and you have the right to disseminate information about it. Bans on 3D guns violate the Constitution not once, but twice, banning your speech and your Second Amendment rights. Okay? The government, I don't think, realizes how dangerous this is, but if we take Heller seriously, and we take Sorrel v. IMS Health seriously, these bans on 3D guns are really unconstitutional. Not just like somewhat, doubly unconstitutional. And we get a very novel Second Amendment case before the court perhaps. All right, we'll see. So next, I want to discuss a couple aspects of how <clears throat> Congress is trying to regulate 3D printed guns. Okay, so the first one is something called the Undetectable Firearms Act, right? What did this bill do? It said every gun <clears throat> must have a certain minimum quantity of metal in it. And this is basically enough metal to trigger a magnetometer at an airport, right? Why do we have this law? Because of the Glock pistol, which maybe some of you have heard of, okay? The Glock pistol is an Austrian pistol uh, made out of metal in these high fiber composites. They're very lightweight. But who do we blame? Bruce Willis, John McClane. So remember the Die Hard movies, right? There's this one scene in the Die Hard movie where Bruce Willis goes, luggage? I don't have a swag, but he says, luggage, that punk pulled a Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up on your airport x-ray machines here, and it costs more than what you make in a month, right? Everything he said was false, okay? <laughs> there is no Glock 7. It's not made of porcelain, and it's made in Austria, okay? Every single thing he made is false. It will show up on your x-ray machine, and it costs about $600. It's not very expensive, okay? So everything he said was false, but people in Congress watched him was like, Oh my God, we have to ban this non-existent gun, right? Okay, this is what, this is what Congress does. They, they, they ban non-existent problems. So they pass this Undetectable Firearms Act to prevent direct these porcelain, I mean, a port was like a teacup, a porcelain <laughs> gun. I mean, it's ridiculous. But anyway, this is Bruce Willis, okay. <laughs> so they ban guns that are made of plastic. And, and really, I don't have much of a problem with this law. If you're trying to have an undetectable firearm, you're probably using it for no good. I mean, you can have a, a metal gun's perfectly good for self-defense. If you're trying to get a gun that won't trigger a metal detector, you're probably bringing it where you shouldn't be. And Heller said in sensitive places you can't have a gun. So I, I'm okay with this law. I don't have much of a problem with it, right? So in other words, if you print a gun totally out of plastic, which is actually not possible, like Cody's gun, that would violate federal law. And I think I'm okay with that law. But Cody was very certain to say, here is a piece of metal that goes into the gun. Now you're going to say, well, he's being cute. But I say he's trying to comply with the law, right? The gun is made of plastic. You can't really 3D print the metal very well. So this is how they're trying to comply with the law. So that's the law from the 1980s, and that's still in the book. So I'm okay with that one. But now we come to the present. After Cody's gun was released, everyone freaked out. And Senator Chuck Schumer, who's never been known to miss a microphone, ran to it. And he said, we have to stop these guns, right? Will someone please think of the children or whatever they say, right? So... There's a couple proposals of how we could actually regulate 3D guns. I think all of them are problematic in one way or the other. 
So one proposal, which is really not good, says we need to ban the materials, right? We need to stop people from acquiring plastic. That way they can't print 3D guns. Okay, this, this is ridiculous for a number of reasons. First, it's overbroad. People have a right to create and express. The same way the government can't tax newspaper ink, right? Or they couldn't ban paper. They can't ban plastic because it's used to create things, right? Second, oh, by the way, there's actually a shop in Austin that was able to make a 1911 handgun out of metal, a 3D printer. This gun, I held in my hand, was made entirely out of a 3D printer. Instead of shooting out plastic like little Yoda, you actually have ground up aluminum and spit out a very fine layer of metal. So basically, banning the materials would not work. Another, another proposal is just as ludicrous. He said, okay, I got an idea. Let's ban gunpowder, right? Oh, that, I think that would have serious Second Amendment problems because people have a right to shoot. Even to shoot, you need gunpowder. You need something to blow up. So that's not going to work well. Another aspect of this is intellectual property, right? Maybe we can use intellectual property. So that Cody Wilson ripped off a Glock handgun, Glock could have gotten an injunction saying, you're violating our patents, right? There's not a question about that. But he used an open source model. Everything he did was open source, so there's not a violation, which makes the entire idea ludicrous. They're basically saying, take down an open source design, which is ridiculous because it's everywhere on the internet. Anyway. But there exists something called digital rights management, DRM. And you may recall if you had an older iPhone or iPod, that initially, if you'd bought a song from the Apple's iTunes store, you couldn't play it on another device. You couldn't play it on an Apple device. This is what's called DRM. It limits music. When you buy a song in the iTunes store, you're not actually buying the song. You're licensing it, right? You're getting a license with it that's temporary. Same for Amazon Kindle. When you buy a book in Amazon Kindle, you don't own the book. You have a license. And oh, by the way, that license can be revoked any time. This actually happened. I'm serious. The book 1984. Had you bought that book on Kindle, Amazon deleted it from your Kindle. It was actually a dispute with the publisher over all books in 1984 where they took it off your Kindle. So much for having a book, right? The same dynamics apply to 3D printing. So follow me here. If I can print a pair of $200 Nike sneakers, like the new LeBrons, right? I can print those on my computer. Am I going to go to a Nike store and wait all night and buy them? Of course not. The same way you can download a, uh, a, an illegal torrent from music or movies, you can download the torrent for a pair of Nike sneakers. Manufacturers are freaking out about this because they realize once 3D printing technology evolves, they will no longer be able to stop people from manufacturing their goods. So you think ripping off music or movies is bad? Wait till you can print out an iPod or an iPhone or a, or a laptop, or just print the entire thing, like the element, just spit it out, right? What if we can do this? So here's the thought. What if the 3D manufa what if manufacturers were able to use DRM 3D printers? The same way your iPod wouldn't play bootleg music, what if your 3D printer won't print something that's patented or copyrighted? Which brings us to the Baptist and bootlegger situation, right? Currently, 3D printers are not nearly good enough to print a pair of Nike sneakers. They're simply not. But they're good enough to prevent guns, right? So what happens is if people say, oh my god, we need to stop Guns. We need to stop guns. What if printers now have filters installed in them? What if the MakerBot printer now has a 3D printer with a filter in it that says, we will not print any guns? Well, you may say, that's great. But that same filter will be used to stop printing other stuff. And not just Nike sneakers, something that looks like a Nike sneaker. Right? This is a classic Baptist and bootlegger phenomenon, which you may have studied in economics. The idea that who wanted prohibition, right? So on the one hand, you have the Baptists, right? The Baptists think because it was alcohol is sinful. But who else wants prohibition? The bootleggers, right? Why? Because they make money during prohibition. They make more money when you can't buy alcohol legally. So effectively, the, the manufacturers will kind of hijack or capture, if you will, the entire effort of putting on filters. So that way, if you try to print a gun on your 3D printer, it'll say, no, you can't do this. But don't think it'll be this simple, right? Well, if you want to print a sneaker that resembles a Nike, it's not exactly it. Oh, it's close enough. You can't print it. This would have a serious limitation on the ability to express yourself and create yourself, right? Which, by the way, can be hacked. Anyone with five seconds can hack their printer. So this is not a very effective method. All DVDs and other hacks, uh, uh, DRMs, have been hacked. So this is not effective. I think it would have a serious crimp on creativity. So if anyone's an IP uh, a fan, this should worry you also.
Okay. I want to close by discussing the, the method the government chose to regulate 3D printed blueprints, which is, as we said, information and data. These are export control laws, which you may have never even heard of, but something called ITAR, uh, the International Traffic and Arms Regulation, which says if you want to export munitions, right, whatever a munition is, you need the government's permission. Now, if you're exporting like a fighter jet or a bomb or whatever, okay, I'll give you that. You need the government's permission. But the government's actually taken the position that code is a munition. And if you want to ship code overseas, you need their pre-approval, which we call prior restraint in the First Amendment. So well, for example, what if we want to ship this cryptography book overseas? Well, the government said, if you want to ship a book, that's fine. Okay. But what happens if I put a CD-ROM? Remember those, right? What well, if I put a CD-ROM in the back of the book with code, the exact same code that's in the book? Then you need the government's permission. The mere fact that you're expressing cryptography in code format rather than printed format means you need the government's permission. The government actually said, you can print out a few thousand page book that lists line by line of the code. That's fine. But if you do it in data form, you're not. This, I think, is, is almost certainly wrong, which brings us back to our friend Cody Wilson. Uh, just about two years ago, uh, in May 2013, the government sent him a letter saying that, you know, the State Department thinks that you are uh, sending out illegal munitions and that you can't do this. We want you to take down all of your information about the Liberator pistol, which, again, is protected by the Second Amendment and the First Amendment. And I want you to pay attention to this very carefully. It says, all data should be removed from public access immediately. They're not telling them to stop shipping guns overseas or smuggling guns. They're telling them to take down data from the internet of a open source, publicly available gun you can find anywhere. This should trouble you significantly under both the First and Second Amendment. Okay? The government perhaps didn't conceive of shipping blueprints online when this regime was created, but I think there are, there are significant problems here. Okay? So I will stop here and give us some time for Q&A. I thank you all so much for your attention. We have a wide material, and I welcome your thoughts. Thank you so much. <laughs> Questions? All right, yes, sir, in the back. I have a question about the, uh, the uh, you were talking about the speech interest, the First Amendment interest that Google might have in resisting some kind of privacy law. Um, and I think it, it sounds like your interpretation of the First Amendment is pretty broad there, but I think that just because something is speech, occasionally we're informed by context, uh, and, and we actually do put pretty significant restraints on speech. I mean, I can tell you, I think cereal prices are too low and should be higher, but if I'm the CEO of General Mills and you're the CEO of Kellogg, uh, we can't have that conversation. Uh, and so, that's partially because of the roles they play, it's partially because what they're saying just isn't salient for any First Amendment purpose. So I guess I don't see where the salience is on Google disclosing private information that someone wanted to private. Right, so the question is one of competition law, right, which, which I discussed briefly. Um, as a matter of competition law, if you're the CEO of General Mills and you're talking about cereal prices and the CEO of Kellogg's is opposed to that, that's actually problematic. But what if you're a newspaper columnist and you're saying, wow, cereal prices are too damn high? Yeah. So, I mean, if you're, if you're a newspaper columnist, I think everyone would say the government could not prohibit you from saying that. Google is actually fashioning itself in the same way as a newspaper columnist would. I know it seems a little bit more like metal rights, which has been repeatedly. Why? Well, because it's personal information that someone has seen. No, we're talking about, I mean, well, we're talking about search results here, right? Yeah, and I'm talking about, I, I think you said that if a, a right to be forgotten law were passed, it would have issues of the First Amendment. And yeah, but what, what, what if the story was, you know, Frosted Flakes are really yucky, they're disgusting. Is that like a medical record? That's like, that's information that people would not like to be linked to. No, of course, and, and I didn't get from your speech that you were saying that any statements about cereal would be out loud. I'm just talking about private information, which is more like a medical record than like mm -hmm. a serial discussion. Mm -hmm. And medical records have repeatedly... But that's by statute. Right? But, but by, by, by statute, medical records are because people didn't consent to it. Usually if, and this is an interesting point, what happens if I write an article saying that, that Frosted Flakes are disgusting and the CEO of General Mills says we need, to, we need that article can't be linked because it hurts my reputation, right? Well, at that point, you know, that's not particularly private. But a right to be forgotten would actually give someone the power to take to their, to their reputation. That, that's what the law says.
Yes, sir. I'm curious about the connection between data and speech, uh, 3D printing right now, but also Inspire magazine that uh, updated and they're reading and it still publishes. It's well, the mouth doesn't sign. I have file of Boston. Mm -hmm. the, the testimony of Tamerl and Sarnaya subscribed to this magazine. It had a pressure cooker bomb manual in mm -hmm. it. Uh, I wonder how, if any, and that's the bomb you made, the, the two bombs that they made. Um, I'm wondering how government can regulate that, if at all. Is it, is it kind of a price of liberty that guys like them can get this information online for free and then act on it? I mean, Brandenburg seemed to say yes, because it's not imminent. But I'm just I'm wondering uh, what, what can be done? It seems like the 3D printing of guns and, and things like Inspire Magazine, they kind of fit the same general area. Right, so what's interesting is I, I am deliberately limiting my talk to a handgun, right? Which is protected by Heller. I'm very, I was very deliberate. What if we're talking about publishing plans for a nuclear bomb? Well, I think there's a different level of Right, so, so at that point, you don't have a second. Okay, so, so let's say making an RPG or some sort of roadside bomb or an IED yeah. or, 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 or a pressure cooker bomb, it's right? Kind of the general first amendment. I, I think, I really think in those cases, merely publishing that information can't be censored. It, it's it's basically putting out information that perhaps in the wrong hands could be harmful. Uh, I mean, maybe you could say, what's the possible value of having a pressure cooker bomb? I, I don't know, but I, I don't I don't think under a first amendment case law you could actually censor that information. I mean, certainly the government can track who's reading it, and the NSA will know about it uh, if it's an online source. But I, I don't think there's a way to actually stop the information. Also. A better way of looking at it is, I would be afraid of a government that could stop that information, right? Could the government actually create a nationwide filter to block access domestically to those sources? Could the government, say we're in the old days, stop the mail, instruct the Postmaster General not to ship those magazines? This actually came up with a lot of the communist publications. They would actually instruct the Postmaster not to deliver communist publications. And the court said, no, you have to deliver these things. There, there are small exceptions, things like child pornography and obscenity. But those are fairly narrow um, uh, things. I think the, the rules on child pornography are probably broader than they, they probably should be. It's kind of something like an exception to normal, normal rules. Other questions? Yes, sir. It, it's, it's a closer call because you don't have the second one backing you up. And there actually may be, so there's case law on um, material support of terrorism, right? And there's a case called Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project a few years ago where the court held that for, for providing some sort of material support to terrorist groups is not speech. And under those precedents, generally speaking, the only reason why you might have a nuclear bomb is to engage in some sort of terrorist activity. And I think at that point, you may have some connection to terrorism that would give the government a license to perhaps stop it. So, I, and I, I, would, I would probably agree. And that's why I limit my talk very clearly to handguns. That's why I limit it to handguns, uh, which is what Heller says, a quintessential self-defense weapon. I, I, So I'm wondering, you know, because if you look at a lot of those things, it's um, expressing the sort of things. It seems to be a limit at a public safety something to do with commerce. So how far are you willing to stretch that down to some particular speech until it starts to have public safety? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. I limited this very closely to the handgun, right? I'm not discussing these various other weapons. I think once you're having other devices that may actually not have a self-defense rationale, the argument for regulation becomes stronger. The argument for being able to, 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 to ban it. Although I think the prior restraint is difficult, but what has to happen is the government has this munitions process for export control. I think on its face, the government can have a process of preventing you from exporting dangerous stuff. I think it must comport with procedural due process, and that should give you certain rights to be heard, and just some first amendment backing on it. 
but I, I'm okay in the abstract with having a process where the government can regulate the transfer of munitions outside the country. I think it's probably, if done correctly, it could be done well. Tax and guns? Well, gun, guns are already taxed. There's a National Firearms Act which taxes machine guns, right? There's actually a, a, a tax which most people can't even pay because they only give a certain number of licenses for it. But they're already they're already taxed on guns, so I mean that that's 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 in existence. So my my, my, my point is very specifically: can they ban or censor this information altogether? The reason why this is important is once the information gets out there, you can't bring it back. Once this information's on the web, it's gone. Go to any torrent, Pirate Bay, whatever, you'll find the blueprints for Cody's gun, even though his he's not publishing it anymore. So it's somewhat chimerical to even attempt, or sorry, quixotic to even attempt to regulate this because information can't be stopped. So uh, I think even recognizing that means it's a little bit more fruitless than possible. Okay, in the back. Who gets to decide what your best gun is in self-defense? Sure. No, I'm not sure. That's the answer, right? If I have a right to self-defense, I decide what the best means of self-defense are. That's my different right. The same way if I have a right to expression, I'll decide what book I want to read, what movie I want to watch. So, I mean, it, it, it's like there's more self-defense right there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but our ideas really do get a lot of attention. So even if the anarchist cookbook printed up plans for a new, maybe we could say the only one that wants to do a plan for a new is someone that's going to do something terrible. We've got to stop people from having it. But also some people might learn something in a different application from reading a plan for a new. Someone might get something just out of expressing the freedom of knowing that they can access that and that they're not being censored from it. So why isn't 3D printing plans, which is what, as far as I understand, the only thing he's doing, he's not printing, he's not sending any parts, he's not actually selling the gun. As long as these are just plans and just ideas, why don't you just put it out there and leave it as only a First Amendment issue and just take a broader protection of the First Amendment issue, one that's backed up by the protections of Anarchy School? Uh, I mean, you're exactly right. If, 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 if this is a case in court and the court results the First Amendment ground, but yeah, we win. But I believe in the Constitution. We have a Second Amendment, and if the government's infringing on those rights, you bring you bring claims. If it's a court case, you bring both. Maybe the court likes one, maybe likes the other. Maybe they work in tandem, right? So I think there are two paths. If it's a court case, I agree. Yeah, I mean, both, both. I'd be happy with either one. If there, there was a holding that you know, first round protects data. Yay, good win. But uh, I think the second one right also. Anything else in the room for another minute or two? No. All right, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. So, do you have time to go? Yeah, my plan's not until 350, so I have five. Okay. Let me go pack up my computer. Yeah. There's not a class here. Okay. So, you're welcome to come. Hi. Thank <laughs> you.